Our speaker today is uh, Harris Zafran, the author of the critically acclaimed, acclaimed Heaven's Bankers, Inside the Hidden World of Islamic Finance. He founded Deutsche Bank's Islamic Finance team and was CEO of its Islamic subsidiary. He was subsequent, subsequently appointed Global Head of Islamic Finance at Barclays. He's partner and CFO at, Global, at Gateway Global, chairman of the UK Islamic FinTech panel and a board member of multiple tech companies. Through Gateway and the panel, he, advise, he advises the rapidly growing Islamic, global Islamic fintech industry and digital Islamic and ethic, uh, ethical uh, economy. Harris was uh, ranked in the top UK top 100 uh, uh, BAME tech uh, leaders by the Financial Times. He holds a degree in physics from the University of Oxford. If you have any questions, please submit them uh, using the Q&A function and there will be time to, to answer them from uh, 6.50 till 10 past seven. Um, and without further ado, I'll hand over to Harris Rafan. Great, thank you Yusuf. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulihi al-kareem. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Thank you very much uh, to ISB for having me. Um, uh, this lecture is uh, a topic that I often deliver, and I deliver a variant of this on many occasions. So apologies if you've heard a variant of this before. Um, it's, it's the one that I'm um, very frequently delivering nowadays uh, for multiple reasons. Um, and I try and uh, update it each time that I do. Um, so, you know, whilst you may have attended, for example, Living Islam a few years ago, and I had a, an early version of this, um, it obviously has been updated to incorporate things like cryptocurrency and Bitcoin since then. Um, I tend to speak to three different types of groups. Uh, one is bankers and practitioners. The other is um, university students. Uh, and the final one is, is teenagers. Now, be before I forget, let me make sure that I share the right screen with you. Okay. So I remember when I was at university um, and I was uh, helping to run the Islamic society, we invited an Islamic bank to come and speak to us. And um, they were gonna talk to us about Islamic finance. Uh, they were you know, bankers who wore sharp suits and they spoke jargon and I didn't understand a word of what they were saying. And nor did I care because you know, to me, finance and economics were just uh, you know, not part of my life. They were irrelevant. I was a science student. And these peddlers of jargon just really didn't connect with me at all on any level. Um, and I think that was a big shame because they missed a perfect opportunity to explain to a group of you know, bright young people uh, who were capable of doing interesting and potentially influential things with their lives, um, you know, what it was to live and work in a halal, ethical and just economy. And I think the reason why they were una unable to connect with us was because they just simply didn't understand their subject matter well enough. And unfortunately, 30 years later, I see that same problem in that Islamic bankers and Islamic finance specialists often don't understand their subject matter well enough to be able to connect with people and explain, um, you know, what is, their, what is their discipline all about? Um, in this discussion, I want us to think about something beyond the boring technicalities of finance or economics. I'm not a, a trained economist. Uh, I've learned my, my uh, uh, I've learned on the job as it were. Um, I'd like us to explore why an economic system uh, that's ordained by God, that's divinely ordained might lead to equality and harmony in society. So our economy is broken, that much is self-evident. I hope that we can all see that. Um, and, and certainly, you know, since the global financial crisis of 2008, 2009, you know, it's been pretty clear that been, there's been an expanding gap, uh, inequality gap between rich and poor. What is it about the Islamic economic model that is potentially fairer and more just? And that's something that I, I hope we can explore a little bit more. So um, this is a picture of Merton College, Oxford. Um, and you might think, why, why do I have a picture of this? Um, maybe I'll, I'll take us back a little bit in history. Um, in the ninth century, Baghdad was a city of, uh, with a population of 1 million people, uh, second only to Constantinople at the time. And it had a reputation for you know, intellectual prowess and riches that were second to none. Um, and under the reigns of four caliphs, um, its citizens lived at the cutting edge of science, of technology, of arts, literature, philosophy, of, of civilization itself. Um, and 
according to one story, the Caliph al Ma'mun is reported to have had a dream in which Aristotle appeared to him in his dream and said, knowledge has no borders, wisdom has no race or nationality, to block out ideas is to block out the kingdom of God. And so when he woke up, he instructed his men to travel to Byzantium and to Persia and bring back the greatest books from the greatest libraries all over the then known world to expand the boundaries of human knowledge. And he established a center for learning, which was called Beit al-Hikmah, the house of wisdom. Now, there's a reason why I'm saying this. There was a surplus in their economy that allowed leaders of vision to take a personal interest in expanding the boundaries of human knowledge. Um, and that was a function of their economic success. So this collation of manuscripts, uh, this procurement of works from all over the known world, sometimes on the backs of a hundred camels, you know, this made us the leaders of scientific, artistic, uh, uh, knowledge of philosophy, of culture, and so on. The world learned from us at that time, even though it doesn't recognize that debt anymore. So when people talk about the Renaissance, it's almost as if the Renaissance happened in a, in a void, in a vacuum and happened by itself. And clearly that's not true. Uh, the Renaissance scholars were building um, uh, off the works of the Islamic uh, Golden Age before them. So this building in the picture is, uh, as I say, Merton College, Oxford. It was established in 1264 by the Bishop of Rochester, who was Walter de Merton. And he was also the head of the New Temple, uh, which was the headquarters of the Jerusalem's uh, Knights Templar. Now, word for word, the statutes of endowment of Merton College are a direct translation from the madrasas of uh, Jerusalem, Cordoba, and Baghdad. So if you look at the waqf, the awqaf, the endowments uh, of that time, you will find word for word translations that have now ended up in the one of the greatest seats of learning in, in the Western world. You know, you can, you can point to a link between, uh, you can point to this direct link between uh, knowledge today and knowledge from the Islamic golden age. We even kickstarted, I believe, merchant capitalism, entrepreneurism, and the tools of commerce in Southern Europe because it flowed down the silk route from Arab and Persian tr traders. And again, that debt has been forgotten. We already had the tools to create a fairer society. We gave those tools to others. And I believe that over time they've become misused. And one of the anecdotes I tend to relate is, is about the, the uh, early life of Imam Abu Hanifa, who was a, a silk trader, a garment trader uh, in the city of Kufa. And uh, a woman came into his shop and um, offered to sell him a, a garment. And she offered, uh, I think it was, she said, a hundred dinars or dirham, dirhams. 100 dirhams and he said no that's too low and she's obviously surprised and uh, so she said okay 200 he said that's still too low no, but he's buying it so he's offering to buy it at a higher price she says 300 and he says that's too low and the woman thinks that he's mocking her so she turns around to walk out of the shop but he says no 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 let's call an independent uh, merchant over to assess the value of this garment and I'll give you a fair price for it so eventually they settled on a price which I think was 400 but it's a demonstration that um, the free market exists. The free market is a good thing. And there are uh, many original sources um, in Sharia that point to the idea of, um, you know, the hand of God in free markets. But at the same time, it's necessary to, um, to ensure that there are certain limits put on the ability of individuals to profiteer, to excessively profit from others' ignorance. Um, and there are, you know, checks and balances in place within our own codified Sharia which we call fiqal mu'amalat, which is the jurisprudence of commercial transactions, that ensures that whilst we can trade freely amongst each other, there are some checks and balances that hold us back. So um, I think it's really necessary for us to examine a question that very few Islamic financiers and Islamic bankers um, uh, take a closer look at, and that is, what is money? Uh, I tend to uh, read um, heterodox as well as orthodox economists and I also like what all um, anthropologists have to say on this subject. And one anthropologist in particular that I'm a big fan of is uh, David Graeber, who recently passed away. He wrote a book called Debt, The First 5,000 Years. Um, in a, the Islamic economic model, money is merely a medium of, of exchange. It has no value by itself. It is used to measure value in other things, in real goods and services, what we call the real economy. According to uh, someone like David Graeber, the anthropologist, he says that money originated as debt. 
and 5,000 years ago, uh, agrarian societies created elaborate systems to buy and sell on credit since no coinage had been invented. So for example, a farmer buys uh, you know, clothes from a merchant with an IOU because his crop has not yet been harvested. So he can't pay with the barter system, which I think is, a, is almost a, um, uh, I mean, I don't think the barter system ever really existed. I think it's a construction by economists. Um, but the merchant then pays, let's say, a carpenter with this IOU to fix a door because the farmer standing in the community is good enough that this IOU is actually worth something. So um, this IOU is taken on faith. Um, and in fact, the, the word credit is derived from the Latin word credere, meaning to believe money originates as debt. And we have faith in that money that circulates in an economy. Now, once a community of that time became large and powerful enough, it, would, it could conquer and enslave uh, surrounding communities um, and human beings became uh, reduced to inventory and material commodities to be traded. So uh, we also know that early civilizations held uh, surplus commodities in temples and temples were not necessarily just places of worship, they were industrial concerns. They were uh, where you know, grains and, and other commodities were stored. And these commodities would be lent to merchants and the merchants would go out and trade them. But of course, risk sharing, profit and loss sharing is very difficult to audit. So the priests would lend to merchant, merchants at a fixed rate and that fixed rate is the rate of interest. And merchants would lend on to others and interest would proliferate in society. So if you, you, know, you lend at a fixed rate, you, you demand collateral in case the loan is not repaid and that collateral could be grain, it could be livestock, what happens if you have insufficient means to repay? Then human beings become that collateral. So now you have a situation where one's children or one's wife becomes a debt peon and they become bonded labor. And that bonded labor can be passed down through the generations. Now, owning a human being becomes debt's most egregious manifestation. And slaves are not just war booty after conquering and enslaving a neighboring civilization. Now they could be anyone debt leads to slavery and of course violent coercion is the primary enforcement mechanism uh, to ensure that debt is passed down through the generations so therefore we see for example we see it in the bible um, uh, in i think the book of nehemiah the, in the fifth century bc the law of jubilee was passed so every seventh year the sabbath year the slate would be wiped clean and the debt peons would be returned to their families um, so you know, we know that religion outlawed interest for the sake of, um, you know, fairness and equality. Um, we actually see in the Bible, and I, I often use this biblical reference, it's from uh, John uh, chapter 2, 13 to 16, and I think also from Matthew chapter 21, 13. Um, there's a reference to Jesus in the uh, temple of Herod, and it says, uh, and making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables and the seats of them that sold doves. And he told those that sold the pigeons, take these things away and do not make my father's house a house of trade. My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. So perhaps the only example of Jesus in the Bible acting in a violent way to get rid of these money changers from the temple of Herod. Um, we see uh, uh, many parallels in Islamic thought, of course, uh, usury is banned by the church uh, from the earliest times and only recently uh, was allowed. Um, our own Imam Ghazali said uh, uh, specifically, it becomes easy for the financier to earn more money on the basis of interest without bothering himself to take pains in real economic activities. Remember, I was talking about the real economy. He said, the interests of humanity cannot be safeguarded without real trade skills, industry and construction. He also said, Allah created dirhams and dinars so that they may be circulated between hands and act as a fair judge between different commodities and work as a medium to acquire other things. In other words, you couldn't trade money, you couldn't trade debt, but you can trade the things that you buy with money. So money itself is just a medium of exchange. I, I often get asked the question, what is riba? Um, and I'm very clear on this. There's a unanimous orthodox opinion that all interest, all excess, because the word riba means excess or a surplus, is interest. It's all within the definition. Um, and, you know, it, even if that's one penny on a million pounds, that's an excess. 
what we find in society today is is interest has become normalized so you know we uh, we we do uh, occasionally on the fringes we hear of scholars who say well it's allowed in this situation and that situation but the general orthodox opinion is that it is um it's a heinous sin uh, we can point to many references in quran and hadith uh, probably the most famous is surah al-baqarah verse 275 allah has permitted trade and forbidden interest it's considered one of the seven most heinous sins it, it ranks alongside shirk and uh, the taking of a life um, and yet, you know, collectively, I think we have, uh, we've ended up normalizing it. I like to show these three pictures to demonstrate what riba does to us. Um, the first picture is a very famous one from uh, the um, Great Depression. It's a, a picture called Migrant Mother uh, by a famous uh, photograph, photographer called Dorothea Lang. It was taken in 1936 by the side of a road of a Californian pea picker whose name is Florence Owens Thompson. She's only 32 years old, but she looks a lot older. Uh, she's the mother of seven children who have been left destitute uh, by the side of the road uh, by drought and financial depression. Um, you know, it's a very iconic figure of the Great Depression. Uh, the second picture, I'm sure you all recognize as one that's uh, a very famous one. And I often forget if it's Ethiopia or Eritrea, uh, a picture of a child on the way to a field, uh, a a feeding station and of course there's a vulture lurking in the background it was a picture taken by a South African photographer called Kevin Carter who um, you know uh, co he committed suicide shortly after this uh, was taken because uh, he felt so helpless in, in the face of such uh, endemic poverty and starvation and the third picture is is not such an iconic uh, picture but it's one that I, I thought was uh, very interesting it's a more recent one uh, it's Grenfell Tower in the background you see the city of London. So I think this juxtaposition of uh, a, a fire that took the lives of I think 72 people just because they wanted to save a few quid uh, per piece of cladding and the billions and trillions that are made in the in the city in the background is a is a it, it, incredible to me that the two can be so close together and yet so far apart. Um, do we think that our politicians can find a solution to inequality? Unfortunately I think the answer is no. Uh, a few years ago in the House of Commons, there was a debate about money creation for the first time in 170 years, and only 30 MPs attended that, uh, that debate. Uh, whereas, of course, we know that the House was full when in that same year they debated their own expenses. Now, at the time, a poll was done of MPs and 71% of them believed that only government has the power to create money. This is not true. In fact, 97% of all money in the economy is created by private banks. Um, you now, clearly, there is a disconnect uh, in what uh, politicians believe and what is reality. Right. Um, I I tell this story because it's a um, it's kind of a corny story, but it helps to illustrate a point. It's the story of the Mexican fisherman, and I'm sure many of you have heard it before. Um, an American businessman is standing at the pier of a picturesque coastal Mexican fishing village with a small boat docked and a fisherman steps out with his catch for the day, which is uh, several large yellow fish tuna. And the American compliments this Mexican fisherman on the quality of his fish. He says, how long did it take you to catch this fish? And the fisherman says, only a short while. The American says, why don't you stay and catch some more? And the fisherman says, well, I have enough to support my family's needs. And the American scoffs and he says, you know, I'm a Harvard MBA uh, and I work as a management consultant from McKinsey and I can help you. What do, what do you do with the rest of your time? And the fisherman says, I sleep late. I fish a little. I play with my children. I take a siesta with my wife. And in the evenings, I stroll into the village and I sip wine and sing songs with my friends. And the American thinks this is ridiculous. He says, OK, let me help you. And the fisherman says, how, senor, how can you help me? The American says, spend more time fishing. With the proceeds, you can buy a bigger boat. And with the catch from the bigger boat, you know, you can buy several boats. And eventually, you would have a fleet. Uh, instead of selling your catch to a middleman, you can have the power to, you know, sell directly to the customer. Um, and eventually, you open your own canning factory. You, you completely cut out the middleman. You control the product, the processing, the distribution. You leave this small coastal village, and you move to Mexico City. And after that, you move to Los Angeles. And then eventually, New York, where you'd run your expanding business. And, uh, you know, the fisherman says, well, how long would all this take? And the American says, oh, you know, 15, 20 years. 
fisherman says, well, what happens after that? And the American says, this is where it gets really interesting. When the time is right, you announce an initial public offering, you sell the company shares to the public and you're rich, you make millions. And the fisherman says, millions, senor, then what do I do? Well, you retire. You can move to a beautiful coastal village where you sleep late, you catch a little fish, you play with your children, you take a siesta, and in the evening you stroll into the village and you enjoy drinks and songs with your friends. So this story is, um, you know, it, it's told in many different versions. That's the version that I know. It's kind of a corny story, as I said. But it illustrates that we live in a world that is defined by GDP, gross domestic product. And GDP measures the exchange value of goods, not the experiential value of our lives. It doesn't measure literacy, mental health, divorce, suicide rates, environmental pollution. It's a very restrictive way of defining progress in human society. And yet that's the, that's the measure that we use. Um, Let me talk to you about um, uh, the difference between exchange value and experiential value. I, um, uh, I'm going to talk later about the concept of a sound money and fiat money. Um, so we're going we're to hold that. We're going to come back to the idea of what constitutes a sound money and why fiat money, that is money that is decreed by a government as legal tender, is, is generally bad for human progress, uh, for environmental stability and for peace. This is, of course, as I'm sure you recognize, a, a picture of the Haram Sharif of Makkah. Uh, and you can barely see the Kaaba itself. It's a tiny, tiny black dot in the center of this picture. And you can, as I say, it's, it's overpowered by the new development next to it, the Abraj al Bait with this huge clock tower in the middle of it. This is what the unbridled pursuit of profit has led to. The, the government there held, holds this up as an example of progress and economic su success, but in the process, it's destroyed history. I mean, it's detonated billions of tons of rock and historical forts and historical buildings around Makkah in order to build this thing. Another example of uh, the pursuit of profit is, um, and this is an example that is used by an, a, an economist called Yanis Varoufakis, uh, who writes a very good book um, called, uh, actually, I'm going to pull it out because I keep forgetting the name of this. It's called Talking to My Daughter About the Economy. And I really recommend you read this. And actually, I bought this in order to explain the economy to my daughter. So it, the book says what it, it does, what it says on the tin. Um, he uses the example of a forest fire. Um, the, a forest fire very strangely raises GDP in that region. It raises the exchange value because it costs uh, fuel. You have to pay firemen's wages. You got to buy equipment. You got to have transport uh, to put out this forest fire. But of course, we know that it reduces experiential value. You don't have a forest anymore. And it reduces environmental value because the forest has an environmental benefit. You know, there are other examples of exchange value versus experiential value. Um, there is a type of valuation methodology used by financiers called discounted cash flow valuation, DCF. And this particular mathematical formula leads to desertification because it places emphasis on near-term projects over long-term projects. And it means that we, we constantly look to quarterly budgets and quarterly statements, and politicians look on five-year time horizons until they next get elected. They don't look on, on lifetime horizons. And this methodology is ultimately leading to, a, a, thank, frankly, a destruction of our planet. Um, this is how modern economics, or what we call neoclassical economics, is taught. It's not really based on reality, but it's constructed with false models. And it's what I call priests speaking Latin. So they've constructed a jargon around themselves, just as medieval uh, priests did, who spoke Latin so that um, you know, the lay people would not understand the word of God. They couldn't connect to God directly, and they had to have an intermediary. Um, and I think that's what economists are doing today. Um, you know, empirical and statistical analysis of economic history has been all but excluded from university curriculum. So you know, economic reality is not really part of the syllabus anymore. Uh, and this lobbying uh, by big corporate leads to a sort of selective amnesia. Great swathes of economic history have been ignored, you know, due to the business interests of large corporations who fund MBA schools and economics departments. Um, and I, I think this is um, modern economics is a dogma that celebrates large corporations but doesn't criticize them. It's what we term the Chicago School of Economics, uh, which advocates the financialization of the economy, which means more debt more financial services. And what does it lead to? It leads to a market society. And a market society 
is a joyless place which measures exchange value and not experiential value. So this is the net effect. Um, this is the Abrajal bait, um, and next to it, I'm sure many of you will recognize the Tower of Sauron from Tolkien's book, The Lord of the Rings. Um, when I was a junior banker, uh, I had a hand, I'm ashamed to say, in financing the Safa Tower, which is one of the seven towers that you see on the left, uh, not realizing that I was participating in the wholesale destruction of our own heritage. Um, and as I said, you know, we, we, our work of financing this tower was partly responsible for the detonation of these mountains uh, around Makkah and the devastation of the surrounding area. And you know, for the government, this is, this is about dragging Makkah into the modern era. But in reality, you know, it's an example of, of vandalism, in my view. It's, it's how you know, uh, modern notions of financial success uh, leads to what some argue is, is, a, is an act of vandalism. And now the clock tower dominates and, and not Kaaba. So, how are we doing for time? Um, I'm going to try and keep some of this brief. Um, as, uh, as Yusuf said at the beginning, uh, I uh, co-founded the Islamic finance team at Deutsche Bank. And we participated in something which I call our own Manhattan Project. Um, for those of you who, who don't know, the Manhattan Project was a project during the uh, Second World War when the Allies brought their best scientific minds together in the Los Alamos Desert to create the atom bomb before Hitler. And we had our own version of the Manhattan Project at uh, Deutsche Bank because uh, we had our, we created a black box that would replicate the financial returns of any financial product in a, in a contractual structure that was Sharia compliant. So this was a technology that could be good, used for good or for bad, just like an atomic bomb and it had a far reaching impact on the industry. What actually ended up happening, not surprisingly, was that our salespeople got hold of this generic fatwa for this technology that we'd created and used it to roll out all kinds of bizarre products uh, that were far, far removed from the spirit of Sharia, but followed the, the letter of Sharia by the Sharia compliant contracts that we had a fatwa for. Uh, and unfortunately, it destroyed the market for what were, what were called structured investment products. And my boss at the time said, we create conservative products for conservative customers and aggressive products for aggressive customers, which I think is a terrible thing to say because there should be a standard. Um, and, and we failed on spirit, even though we passed on letter. Uh, we were able to create, for example, products um, that uh, some of you may have heard of, heard of a product called a CDS, a credit default swap. It's like an insurance product. So I can take an insurance on a, a government's debt defaulting, let's say Greek sovereign debt default. It's a bit like my neighbor who is an arsonist being allowed to hold an insurance policy on my house, right? That's not allowed by the way, you can't do that in the insurance industry. I, I can't legally do that. But in the financial markets, I can do that. And now, you know, magically I have this Islamic product that allows me to do exactly this, even though, you know, the spirit seems wrong. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this, this uh, technology we developed uh, created a big spat in the industry and very famous scholar in the industry described this as the doomsday fatwa, and I'm afraid I'm inclined to agree with him. Uh, now I feel that Islamic banks in particular, who um, filled the vacuum that Deutsche Bank and others left behind when they left the industry shortly after the financial crisis, um, have, um, are not the future of the Islamic finance industry. Um, you know, I draw many parallels between what's happening in the Islamic finance industry today, uh, the way that products are created, and what happened to Christian financiers in the Middle Ages when the church banned usury, but Christian financiers very cleverly created three contracts in one called Contractum Trinius, each of which was individually compliant with the church's ban on usury, but collectively allowed lending at interest. And of course, the church allowed this because, you know, at least in letter, it was correct. Uh, until, you know, we get to 1917, by which time the Vatican has decided it, it itself will invest in interest bearing bonds. And you know, since then the church has turned a blind eye to usury. Um, I'm worried that Islamic finance is going the same route and that we're using our own modern version of contractum trinius to create loan with interest like contracts uh, without addressing the core fundamentals of what is money and what is the real economy. At this point, I often talk about Goldman Sachs, but I think that's a rather technical subject. And I think we're running a little bit short on time, but if anybody's keen on learning more about them, then please do ask him the questions afterwards. 
Right. So um, uh, you've heard me criticize, um, you know, the Islamic finance industry for failing to uh, follow the letter of the law, uh, the spirit of the law rather, rather than the letter of the law. I, I think we have an issue in the UK specifically, which is that uh, I think the British Islamic banks are um, failing to address the core needs of their customers. And they haven't won the hearts and minds of their customers. And I think there's a very specific reason for that. Generally, the senior management of the British Islamic banks are not selected from the people who buy those products. There is limited cultural affinity between the two groups. They don't buy Sharia compliant products for their own portfolios and they hire and promote people in their own mold. Uh, there are no women at those levels. There are very few people under 45. There are very few practicing Muslims at those very senior levels. If you are a youngster of say Pakistani or Bangladeshi heritage, you know, you typically will be seen as the IT contractor. Um, so, you know, sadly, this is, this is a failing of the, the UK's Islamic finance industry and explains why since their inception, they have made over 200 million pounds of cumulative losses. Um, uh, and they are, they are not really recognizing how to, how to correct this. Um, there is a, a tendency within the Islamic finance industry globally to what they say reverse engineer conventional debt products rather than addressing the fundamentals of what is a risk sharing economy. So this lack of understanding of, of the customer base of cultural affinity, uh, this lack of understanding of a holistic, sustainable, ethical economic model this kind of vague understanding of what it means to be Sharia compliant, usually by reference to some prohibitions. You know, I think this is a lazy and ultimately harmful understanding of the Islamic economic model. So about three years ago, I write, wrote a white paper for HM Treasury uh, to put the city and the UK back on the global Islamic finance map. And I contended that the UK Islamic finance industry was losing ground to other world centers. Um, despite the rhetoric of, you know, people in the industry and indeed, you know, politicians as well. And I contended that fintech financial technology was the future. I mean, many of you, I'm sure, are using online and mobile bank accounts. You're probably using companies like Starling and Monzo and Revolut and others. And you're probably hearing about digital challenger uh, financial uh, services from companies like Kestrel, for example. Um, you know, I know that some of you uh, are, are doing internships for companies like Kestrel and Risk and others. So there's a lot of interesting stuff that's happening on the ground in the Islamic finance industry at the grassroots level. And I think it's very technology led and it's led by young people who are more idealistic, who want to reclaim the narrative about the Islamic economy from the Islamic banks. They're creating their own jobs. And I would say that that's the future. Um, you know, they're using tech uh, uh, solutions for real economy problems, they're solving their own problems. And I would recommend to the Islamic banks, the traditional ones, that failing to adapt is an existential threat for them. I'm going to skip global halal economy. Um, I think it's a fairly self-explanatory sort of, uh, we, we know that it's a very, very large um, economy globally. We know uh, there is a market to be addressed. Uh, London is, is the center, the Western center of the halal economy with the most number of halal businesses that are founded outside of the Muslim world. And I think uh, a number of these Islamic fintech firms that established themselves in London are actually looking at the global market of perhaps $5 trillion. So, uh, you know, I, I sometimes wonder whether this is the beginning of the end for Islamic banks. Um, if you look at that graph on the left in 1990, some people saw no future or a practical application for the World Wide Web. Uh, you know, it was clunky. It was slow, uh, it was inefficient, it was expensive. And now of course we can't live without it. Um, FinTech is any technology that is used to support or enable banking and financial services. Uh, and you know, the examples I've used are, are, are companies like Revolut and Monzo. And its rise coincides with the rise of the smartphone which has led to digital connectivity as well as an economic downturn which of course means decreased consumer sentiment. Um, you know, job losses, wage stagnation, and it's, and as a result of uh, regulatory changes. So you've got overburdened banks, for example. So um, all of these factors are, are um, combining to you know, give rise to, to fintech. And I think that there's a very exciting happening taking place in the Islamic fintech landscape. And that is that the UK has very recently overtaken Malaysia to become, become the world's number one destination for Islamic fintech firms. So if you see one of these so-called unicorns arising, 
in the Islamic fintech world, I believe it's most likely to arise from London. Right. Oh, sorry, skipped on there. Um, this is one that creates a little bit of controversy with the scholars. Um, in the 19th century, the governor of Egypt, the Ottoman governor of Egypt, uh, Mehmed Ali Pasha, introduced water faucets, taps, into the Mehmed Ali Mosque in Cairo. And the ulama of the time debated whether using these taps was permissible for wudu, which you, you'd think is a kind of crazy discussion, right? Why, why would that not be allowed? But this was a debate at the time. And apparently at the time, the only group of scholars who permitted the use of taps to perform ablutions before prayer were the Hanafis. And so taps became known as Hanafiya throughout the Arab world, and they're still known that way today. Other things that have been banned by scholars uh, you know, over history include the printing press. So the printing press was banned on pain of death uh, in uh, 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 you know, the Ottoman period. So the first printing press was established in Istanbul in 1727 and aroused so much suspicion because it was presumably because it uh, clashed with scholars oral tradition, um, it was shut down. So you know, there was almost a suicidal willingness to embrace ignorance and I think this was a contributory factor in the decline of the Ottoman Empire. Ottoman scholars also debated you know, the, the distance of telegraph wires from a mosque, uh, arguing that it conveyed the voice of shaitan. Deobandis uh, banned the loudspeaker at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, in the 1980s, the South African ulama, some of the ulama banned television, irrespective of content. Um, you know, now we think that we have scholars who are, you know, more sophisticated, you know, they're more in touch, they're more tech savvy, they're more scientifically aware. I'm not really sure I agree with that because I've seen some incredible discussions about cryptocurrency, for example. Um, and, and let me take us take a step back about, you know, what is sound money? Sound money is a, a, a medium of exchange uh, and not a commodity to be traded. It's a store of value it's a unit of account you know it's decentralized it cannot be manipulated by one individual party or a small group of parties parties it has acceptability throughout society so this particular slide i show uh, is a slide to compare gold versus bitcoin versus dollar now the thing about gold is it historically has been the soundest form of money because over a long period of time, it's led to economic and political stability. Um, and uh, of course it has disadvantages. You know, it's, it's not easily spendable. It's not easily portable. Uh, you can't carry it around. You know, it's not easily theft resistant. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, um, it has things going for it, which is that it's inflation proof. If you chart the, the value of the dollar versus gold uh, during the 20th century, you'll see that the dollar has devalued in real terms by uh, 96%, whereas gold has remained consistent. In fact, throughout human history, it's remained consistent. Bitcoin has many of the characteristics of gold, but it has more than that. It also um, has, um, it's also portable because it's electronic, it's open source, it's decentralized, it's divisible, it has scarcity, uh, you know, it has uh, usefulness. Uh, eventually, it's, it's within 10 years, you know, we've come a long way. People often say to me, you can't use Bitcoin because I can't buy things with it. It's not very stable. But I say to them, it's actually 10 years into a 30 year project. And once it's been substantially mined, it will reach that level of stability. And it will be a sort of gold 2.0. Whereas the dollar has none of these things. The dollar is uh, devalues over time. You know, we don't record this in our tax returns at the end of every year. But effectively, the government is taking money from us without us realizing it. Uh, and as I say, over the course of 100 years, the dollar has devalued by 96%. And that's similar to other currencies like sterling uh, and so on. Um, there was a quite a debate amongst scholars on the Sharia compliance of, um, of cryptocurrency. Um, and a number of social media scholars, as opposed to technical experts in the subject of fiqh mu'amalat, uh, came to the conclusion and, and, uh, that uh, you know, cryptocurrency is haram and that we should ban all such currencies. Uh, and you know, some of them have published you know, rambling diatribes on this subject. Um, they've even said, we don't need to go into technical details of how to create a cryptocurrency. We don't need to discuss these things. 
they've gone on to to uh, you know display some you know factual inaccuracies in fact blatant errors in economics and the monetary system you know displaying a, a complete lack of technical understanding and you know they've said things like paper money is created by governments and central banks which as i've said earlier is completely wrong 97 percent of money is in fact created by private banks under the fractional reserve banking system um you know they say that uh, government makes an undertaking to replace paper money with something else. This is not true at all. In fact, you can read this on the Bank of England's own website. If a shop refuses to accept a 10 pound note, there's nothing the Bank of England can do to force the shop to take it. Um, they say that crypto, cryptocurrencies are not backed by anything real or a government undertaking. Well, nor is the dollar, nor is the pound, nor is the euro. It's not backed by any undertaking. It comes back to that Latin word credere, which gives us the word credit to believe. We have faith in money that will, it will be accepted by other people doesn't actually have intrinsic value. They say that Bitcoin has volatility, that prices are jumping around. Uh, well, if we banned everything with volatility vol that had volatility, we would never invest in early stage companies because they are risky by their very nature. Uh, they say that Sharia requires backing uh, of a currency by gold. This is not true. Gold is a very pure sound money but one does not need to back in Sharia, one does not need to back a currency with gold. So I think these rambling and misinformed uh, fatawa are causing serious harm to, to us as an ummah. Uh, uh, I think that we are denying ourselves a very powerful weapon in uh, the macroeconomic system. So I come back to this idea of is Bitcoin Sharia compliant? Well, to be a valid medium of exchange, cryptocurrency needs to have three characteristics, which are wealth, legal value, and currency attributes. And there are three thick interpretations. One is that Bitcoin has neither wealth or uh, uh, currency attributes, uh, uh, i.e. a medium of exchange. The other view is that it has wealth, but it does not have thamania, the currency attributes. And the final view is the view that I have, which is that uh, Bitcoin has both wealth and currency attributes. It is a real thing, is what I say. It is a real thing because it is as real as the digital numbers in your bank account, which are in pounds sterling. Uh, and, and that does not have any tangibility in a conventional sense either. So I often show this slide, which is um, uh, 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 on the left is uh, Mel Gibson playing uh, William Wallace, who fought for independence for Scotland. And he represents freedom. He's shouting freedom in that famous battle scene. And I think that a sound money is one that is free from manipulation by a single entity, like a central bank. And by the way, I don't think central banks have done a very good job at all. I think they've done a disastrous job since the global financial crisis. What they actually did was to um, deliver money at the top level to financial institutions, the richest organizations in our society, which allowed asset prices to be bought at very cheap rates and inflating the value of stocks and real estate and other asset values. So that rich people got even richer. That was not the point of quantitative easing. And I fear that the same thing might be happening again. So we've got the next stage of quantitative easing by central banks where rich people are getting richer through asset price inflation. And those at the bottom are not seeing a trickle down effect. And that is because money is being manipulated by a small group of individuals or organizations. Whereas a decentralized global currency like gold, potentially like Bitcoin, cannot be manipulated by a small number of people. On the right, we have uh, Mark Zuckerberg, who uh, with a consortium of others, uh, Facebook and a consortium of others have created a, what they call a cryptocurrency called Libra. I do not believe that this is a cryptocurrency at all. I believe it's a stable coin, which is something completely different. Uh, and I think that actually it may cause a lot of harm because I think there are other nefarious things that can be done with such a, a type of currency. Uh, and so it's very, very important that we distinguish between different types of cryptocurrency. And we recognize that ones which are a sound money, I believe need to have characteristics like gold. Again, we're running short of time and uh, I haven't checked my message, but I'm sure Yusuf is, uh, is, is probably gonna ask me to move along quickly. So let's come to our, our final slide. Um, what's gonna happen in the future? Well, um, as I've said to you, I, I think that uh, a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin really does represent a challenge to central banks around the world. Um, uh, and it has the, the, it has the potential to really change our economies in a, in a beneficial way. Uh, it has utility as a currency, which is improving over time. 
Uh, you know, it has speed of transfer, which is improving over time. It's non-counterfeitable through this technology that's called the blockchain. Uh, it's resistant to theft if it's properly stored. You know, it's open source, it's decentralized, it's durable. You know, it really is something that I think is, is, is you know, quite astonishing piece of technology. What's amazing to me is that it's apparently allegedly been invented by a person or group of people called Satoshi Nakamoto, who, you know, may or may not be a, a real person, uh, and yet, um, you know, is probably a non-Muslim, and yet is probably the most Sharia compliant cryptocurrency that I've ever heard of. Um, and, and that to me is astonishing. It's a technology created by others that may be the closest that I can think of to an Islamic economic model. Um, what I think is happening in the Islamic economy is that Islamic banks will, uh, will fail to adapt because they are failing to recognize the very obvious signs on the horizon. They, they lack diversity, uh, they lack vision, senior management are um, from a particular demographic group that doesn't really represent us, at least that's the case in the UK. They hire in their own mold, uh, they're struggling to connect with their customers. I think um, the non-Muslims have invented uh, you know, there's, there's a very um, Islamic type of, of, of economic system, this cryptocurrency. I think millennials are the key to the advancement of the Islamic economy. They don't carry the baggage of, you know, middle-aged bankers like myself. Uh, they're tech savvy, they're idealistic, uh, they're passionate. Uh, I meet many of them at, you know, university campuses. Um, you know, they're creating fintech and crypto and blockchain and green en energy and ESG, this environmental, social and governance products. Um, they're going back to their understanding of money, they're understanding their heritage in learning and the branches of, of sciences. Um, I don't think we'll succeed if we, you know, um, devolve our responsibility to others. I think we need to, to seize that moment ourselves. Um, I think capital needs to be redirected away from established financial service sector uh, and towards disruptive early stage uh, tech companies. Um, you know, I, I think the priests who speak Latin have been uncovered for the frauds that I think they are. Uh, and I think there is a heterodox solution out there. Uh, so I'm very um, optimistic, despite my, uh, my criticisms of the Islamic banking industry, that the Islamic economy can right itself. And hopefully someone who's listening to this lecture, you know, might think of creating their own tech and financial tech company that can solve one of these financial problems that they see out there. So thank you very much for listening. And I'm going to hand back to uh, Yusuf to, to see if there are any questions. Assalamualaikum. Thank you for that um, talk. I, I thought it was really insightful. Um, so now we're just going to move on to the, uh, the Q&A part of um, the, the talk. Uh, so the first question is, uh, how do you respond to people who say that um, interest is a reward for taking risk and also as an incentive for saving? Um, the question I, I think I would ask is, is interest really a reward for taking risk? Because if I lend to somebody and say, give me, you know, if I, here's 100 pounds, give me 105 pounds back. Um, what risk am I taking with that five pounds? If I link it to a specific economic activity or a, a business venture, uh, and I link it and I link the return of that principle that I lent um, to the return that I make, then that's sharing in the risk of that individual. And I should stand to lose as well a profit. But if I say, I don't care what happens, I want my five pounds extra at the, back, at the end of the year, then you know, that, is, that is an excess of money. And I can only make money by having money. And that's not fair. The right thing is to be able to allow individuals to profit through their sweat. And that's why you have this concept of mudaraba. And in fact, the Prophet Sallallahu himself was a mudarib. He would take uh, the capital of a Rab al-Mal uh, and use it to buy goods and trade those goods and come back and then split the profits in a predetermined manner. And that's a risk sharing uh, concept. Whereas the concept of lending money at interest is an increase of capital on capital. And, and that's haram because that's making money out of nothing. And there's not a real risk that's been taken on a trading or business venture. No matter how bankers like to dress it up, when you, when you look through how they dress it up, they're actually taking very little risk for themselves. Thank you for your answer. Um, so the second question is, um, 
one of the criticisms of Islamic banking is that um, it is too idealistic um, in terms of we don't have a practical way out of the current system uh, with interest and, and things. Uh, so what are your thoughts about that on uh, how do we tackle uh, the issue? Yeah, that's a problem I've been grappling with for the best part of 26 years. Um, and I've tried to change it from the inside by the work that I did at Deutsche and then Barclays and then a, 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 an Islamic uh, uh, boutique investment bank. Um, and I've, I've realized to myself that every time I think I take a step forward, I actually probably take two steps back. Um, the, the, the person who asked this question is absolutely right. I mean, there, there is, a, there is a, an ideal that I would like us to work towards, but practically speaking, uh, we live in a macro economy in which you know, banks operate under what's called a fractional reserve banking system. They're required to take deposits and they lend out more money than they uh, have in deposits. Uh, and that fractional ratio is, is, you know, is the basis on which they do business. Um, they are all regulated by uh, you know, their, their official regulators or central banks in the countries in which they operate. They have to abide by the same rules that conventional banks abide by. So they're hamstrung. You know, they have to operate the way conventional banks operate. It's no surprise that they reverse engineer conventional debt products and they make them look and feel like interest-bearing loans. Uh, in a sense, I've, you know, it's, it's hard to be entirely um, you know, critical of that. But at the same time, I think because they haven't tried to fight that in any way, they haven't had the people who understood what money means and what the Islamic economy me means, to be able to present to a central bank and say, you know, we don't want to do things this way. We'd like to try do, doing things this way. And we think that would be a much higher penetration rate amongst our target demographic if we do it that way. Believe me, that conversation has never been had. It's never been had because the people who are presenting that argument to central banks and regulators themselves only know conventional banking. So I, I, what I'm seeing at the grassroots level is individuals who are saying, I don't really like the way how things are operating at the moment. And I think there's another way. And I think it's a risk sharing way. And I'm gonna try and do it this way. But at some point they'll have to go to the regulator and say, you need to give us the same breaks for example, tax legislation that you give to conventional financial institutions. Otherwise, we won't be able to offer this product to the public and the public want this product. Thank you. Um, so our next question is, do you think the notion of negative interest rates and the fact that individuals will have to pay the, pay the banks to hold their money while the banks profit will drive common folks to the Islamic banking industry? Uh, no, it would probably drive them to the conventional banking industry because if the, you know, if I can if, if I can borrow money without paying interest. In fact, if I get paid to borrow money, then why wouldn't I do it, right? Um, I, you know, I, who knows what one could predict coming out of that? But uh, there is a danger that negative interest rates will actually move people away from Islamic finance uh, because they'll see the benefits of that for themselves. Thank you. Um... So another one is Islamic banking um, pr uh, products currently on the market. Are they um, are they truly Sharia compliant? Um, Islamic banks have Sharia boards. It's usually a board of three scholars who are highly trained in fiqh muamalat, which is the jurisprudence of commercial transactions, and they're also um, uh, very uh, you know they are they are themselves experts on financial instruments. Um, and these individuals have an incredible amount of training and understanding of the products and the contractual structures associated with those products. So when they certify those products as being Sharia compliant, but providing they are you know, credentialed Sharia scholars, their fatwa carries a lot of weight. Um, and I have a huge amount of respect for these guys, even though I criticize the practices of Islamic banks and how those products are, are operated and offered to customers. What I think what the Sharia scholars do behind the scenes is, is actually um, you know, very commendable. Um, so when you go to an Islamic bank for a home purchase product, yes, there are some scholars out there who will say it's not a truly risk sharing product. But for the reason that I've already said, they, they are a fractional reserve bank that operates within this economic system. They abide by the rules of the central bank or the FCA or whoever the regulator is in their jurisdiction. And they therefore have to follow certain rules. Therefore, they end up offering products which do look and feel like the products offered by conventional banks. Now, People say to me, oh, yeah, but I went to an Islamic bank and they offered me a mortgage 
and it looked like a loan with interest. And, and yes, economically, it will look like a loan with interest. But bear in mind that in, in many of those cases, the Islamic bank will take legal title to the house, the property that you're buying, and then uh, rent you the portion of the house that you don't own. So if the split is 90-10, so you put a 10% deposit down, they lend you 90%, you are paying rent on the 90%. And people say, oh, well, that's like a loan with interest. Well, actually, no, it's not like a loan with interest. I mean, the bank is taking a real asset risk. That's a different risk to the risk that conventional banks take. So in the same way as, you know, you buy, you know, halal uh, meat, halal lamb is slaughtered in a particular way. Uh, and um, in theory, at least, it should be... Um, uh, uh, its life cycle should be uh, uh, cared for in a, in a particular way, uh, but it's certified as being halal. Does it look any different from non-halal lamb? Does it feel any different? Does it taste any? I actually don't know. Does it taste any different? But I, you know, I'm sure it can't be hugely different. It's still lamb, and yet one has been sanctified by God. One has not been, and so sometimes it's important that both form and substance is important. The form is is important as well. Uh, and that's why I think criticism of Islamic banks for offering products that look too much like conventional products is not necessarily a valid criticism. I hope that helps. Thank you. Um, so someone's asking whether you could give any resources for educating people about um, what can be a massive jargon filled subject. Okay, so uh, this is a really good question. I almost never recommend books about Islamic finance because most of them are just textbooks. And why do you want to read a textbook with diagrams? It's not, you know, if you really seriously want to study for an Islamic finance qualification, that's wonderful. That's great. I encourage you. But that won't necessarily um, give you a meaningful insight into the, the Islamic economy or an ethical economy or an economy that's governed by environmental, social and governance principles. Actually, and, I, and I've got a stack of books on my desk here. One of them that I showed you earlier was Yanis Varoufakis talking talking to my daughter about the economy. I think that's a brilliant book for ex ex explaining in a very simple way to people who aren't trained economists, you know, what does the economy mean? This is a great book, David Graeber, Debt the First 5,000 Years. Um, a, a brilliant, brilliant individual who passed away recently. He's an anthropologist who contends that debt, uh, that money originates as debt. Um, if you wanna learn about, you know, Bitcoin and why, why it's, why it's so important, why the gold standard is so important. This is a really good book, The Bitcoin Standard by Sefer Dinamus. Um, this one is a bit of a cult classic in the Islamic finance industry by a guy called Tariq al-Diwani. Um, he, he wrote a book called The Problem with Interest. It's, um, I mean, it, it's a book that, you know, it, again, it, 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 uh, it does what it says on the tin. Um, I think general reading about the economy about the financial crisis is very good for people. Try this one, Michael Lewis, The Big Short. Some of you might have seen the movie, but this is a great explanation from the eyes of three groups of people who saw the financial crisis unfolding in 2008. You know, what actually is, my wife just walked into the room, held up a sign. Can I have that sign, please? I, <laughs> she's running out the room. She says, mention Heaven's Bankers, which is my book. Um, but as I said to you, um, reading textbooks on Islamic finance is, is not a, um, uh, you know, I hate to say this, it's probably not going to be a great use of your time if you're not a technical specialist already, or if you're not um, studying for an Islamic finance qualification. A general understanding of the economy, of the world, of business matters, of why the financial crisis happened, of why politicians don't understand money creation. I think these kind of um, insights are are much more valuable to us and give us a better insight into how we might solve inequality in society and therefore solve capitalism. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned um, about um, Goldman Sachs earlier. Um, so I was just wondering, and someone else was um, asking whether you could just uh, speak a, bit, a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, I have to, here I have to be very careful because I don't want to be sued. Um, and in fact, actually, when I wrote my book, there was a six month process of a libel reading by lawyers to make sure that, you know, we wouldn't get sued by any large financial institution. Uh, but there's one story that I can tell you, and that is that um, around about 2011, uh, Goldman Sachs uh, came to me and asked me if I would help them launch a an Islamic bond called a sukuk on the capital market. So this is a an instrument that's listed on an exchange. Uh, which allows an entity to borrow money on the financial markets. 
and uh, they wanted to do it in a Sharia compliant format, which is called Sukuk. And so this Islamic bond, they wanted to raise about $2 billion worth, and they wanted to use a specific um, contractual structure called a commodity murabaha. It's not important what that exactly is, other than to say it can be quite controversial because in many cases, it looks and feels like a loan with interest. And what I said to them was, look, this particular contractual structure is problematic. Here are some other ways that you can do this. And they said, no, 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 no. We want to use a commodity murabaha because it looks and feels like a, uh, a loan with interest. Our credit traders and our, our compliance department and our legal department and all these other people within our firm can get comfortable with it. And um, you know, I, I said, well, you know, there is one way that you can use this particular contractual structure in a way that will not be, well, will be relatively less controversial. Um, but first of all, tell me, what do you intend to do with the money? And their literal words to me were, don't ask too many questions. And I said, well, hang on, you know, these are Islamic investors. They need to know all these things. Transparency is a fundamental component of the financial transaction taking place here. And if you say, don't ask too many questions, i.e. for general corporate purposes is, is what you're gonna use the money for, then that's not gonna fly. I said, thanks, but no thanks. I really can't work on this. I, I hope you know you go ahead and, and find somebody you can work with. So they did and the, the Islamic bond failed. They were unable, it was the only failure at the time, in fact, they were unable to launch that bond. And then I, I think a short while afterwards, maybe a year or two later, they came back to the market and they launched it with all the changes that I'd suggested. Unfortunately, I never got paid for it, but um, you know, they, they launched it with all the changes suggested and it was successful. So that was an example of a very large financial institution recognizing that there's this untapped demographic out there that they need to access and they need to make money out of them, but they will go any route that they deem necessary in order to make money out of them without thinking about the fundamentals, about the nature of money, about risk sharing, about the, the divide between the financial economy and the real economy. And that's what we're all about. That's what we need to do. We need to come back to those fundamentals. It goes to the heart of the matter. And the large conventional financial institutions, they've got some great innovation. They've got some great talent. They've got some incredible people. I wouldn't have been able to do what I did 15 years ago with Deutsche Bank if I hadn't been surrounded by incredibly smart, able, dynamic, motivated people. And you don't find that in all sorts of organizations. But at the same time, you know, we need to find a happy medium between that incredible wealth of talent and you know, the kind of the, the ethics that has to bind that talent and has to restrain and constrain it. Uh, and, and that I think we haven't found yet in this industry. So I'm hoping that the next generation will retain that idealism that they currently have so they, that they can develop massively innovative new products that haven't been seen before in the way that Deutsche Bank and others did in earlier years. But this time with the overlay of good ethics, not just halal, but also tayyib, not just permissible, but wholesome, right? Thank you, I think uh, that was very insightful. Um, so yeah, uh, the next question is um, about regarding the, um, the risk and stability of Bitcoin. Uh, so they're asking, can it not be manipulated by uh, sophisticated traders by selling on the various exchanges? And um, is Bitcoin not like gambling where you're, um, where there is, there's so much uncertainty in what you're doing and uh, Bitcoins are not tangible and you, you can't really, you can't, yeah, you can't touch it. Okay, there's, there's like a million and one things to answer in that. So thank you to whoever asked that question. I'm gonna have to try and break it down a little bit. Um, the first question on manipulation, um, very briefly, if you don't have access to 51% of the network, you can't attack the currency successfully. So if you want to change the algorithm, you have to own 51%. And there have been occasions where Bitcoin has been attacked in the past, and nobody has succeeded in breaking that. So uh, on the basis that it's, it is now very widespread, and it is highly, highly unlikely that anybody could gain 51% control of it, um, the, the, uh, the opportunity to manipulate it has become, has increasingly tended towards zero. And I personally can't see it happening now that we are substantially on our way to mining it fully. Uh, the next question was regarding gambling. Um, this, is, this is one of the, the arguments that a number of social media scholars use, which is highly volatile. It's like speculating, it's gambling. You just, yeah, if you, in, if you, you know, quote unquote, invest in something in order to make a quick buck, you could argue that you're being speculative in the way that you might be speculative betting on a horse race, right? Uh, and that may fall into the definition of gambling. But 
I see Bitcoin as a 30 year project with a very real economic benefit. And in the same way as if you invest in, an, in a startup company, not knowing if that company is going to succeed or fail, it's a digital investment. It either fails or it, or, it, or it succeeds. You know, you could lose all of your money or you might make a lot of money. And that's the same thing. It's not haram to invest in a startup company. Otherwise, none of us would ever be entrepreneurs. None of us would ever start our own businesses. It's the same, it's the same volatility as Bitcoin in the early stages. Bitcoin's volatility will settle over time and therefore it will become less of a speculative gambler's investment and more of a real form of currency. Uh, the next question was regarding tangibility. I think I mentioned this when I spoke that there's nothing real about a 10 pound note. You know, there's no undertaking from a government to repay you anything, to back it with anything. It's all based on faith. And if we, again, actually this, uh, again, I, I point to this book by David Graeber and it talks about a history of money. Uh, you know, all sorts of things have been money in the past. Um, natives on South Pacific islands have used seashells as a form of money, and that's entirely valid. It's entirely valid to use it as a medium of exchange to help you ex exchange real goods and services because it's portable. It's easy to carry around. It's divisible, you know, uh, and, and all of society, at least that society, accepts that it is a form of money. In World War II prisoner of war camps, they use cigarettes as a form of currency. Again, it's entirely valid. You know, the prisoners decided that cigarettes are a form of currency and they traded it amongst each other as a way of uh, buying real goods and services from each other. Um, currency is what we decide that it is. It, it's based on, on a number of things and one of those is social acceptance. So if society accepts that Bitcoin or some other cryptocurrency is a form of currency, then it's a form of currency. It doesn't need to be real any more than the digits in our bank account are real. Uh, and not for a moment should we think that if I have a thousand pounds sitting in my bank account, that somewhere in a bank vault are a thousand pounds of pound notes sitting there, you know, waiting to be claimed by me. By me. That's not true at all. In fact, you know, for every thousand pounds that the bank actually has, and in a digital form, by the way, it lends out perhaps 10,000 pounds, sometimes 20,000 pounds. That's money that's been created effectively from thin air. That's not real at all. That's no tangibility to it. And yet we believe that the pounds and the dollars and the euros and the whatever that we use nowadays are real money, but they're not. They're fiat money. Fiat is decreed by government as being legal tender. So Bitcoin is as real as anything else. Thank you. I think this is gonna to have to be the last uh, question, but I think it's quite important. Um, essentially, what does um, an Islamic mortgage or a riba free mortgage look like? So the majority of scholars have accepted that um, if a, an Islamic bank buys a house and takes title to it and then rents the portion of the house that you don't own back to you, they consider that to be a halal transaction. So if you, if you go to a bank like Al Rayan, for example, and you um, and you say, I have a 10% deposit, I need 90% financing. Let's say the house costs 100,000 pounds. The bank will pay 90,000 pounds towards the cost of buying that house. And then they will charge you rent on 90% of, of the total value of the house. Now, some people will argue when you sell the house, the bank should take a risk in the value of the house when you sell it. So if it goes up in value, you share the upside. If it goes down in value, you share the downside. But the majority of contractual structures that are used in home financing nowadays by Islamic banks are a, a effectively a fixed repurchase value, i.e. if you bought that house for 100,000 pounds, when you uh, uh, buy back the units of the house that you don't own from the bank, that will cost you the original value. So if they lent you 90,000 pounds, you repay them 90,000 pounds to buy back the full principal value of the house. In the meantime, you're paying rental payments on the portion of the house that you don't own. Uh, and if anyone wants to look this up, look up uh, Ijara, uh, that means lease and diminishing Musharaka. Musharaka is an investment partnership uh, whereby you share in a venture of some kind. Thank you so much for taking the time um, to speak to everyone and answer so many questions. I, w I just wish we had some um, more time to to just talk so much more about uh, the topic. So I think it's been really interesting. Um, but yeah, thank you. I think we're going to have to leave it there for now. Um, um, so yeah, thank you.